Greetings and welcome to the first presentation in this fifth semester, wow, of the Emerald Choral Academy. I am Gary Cannon, the Artistic Director of the Emerald Ensemble, a professional choir based in Seattle. This Emerald Choral Academy is a series of interactive webinars during which our area's leading professional choristers reveal their tricks of the trade to community singers. These webinars are then made available freely to singers across the world via YouTube. The Emerald Ensemble acknowledges that we operate on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish tribe, a past and present, and we aim to honor with gratitude the land itself and the lives of the Duwamish peoples. This presentation is funded in part by a grant from the Washington State Arts Commission, in addition to the National Endowment for the Arts, For Culture, the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, and many generous donors. We encourage anyone participating or viewing this webinar to make a donation as you are able at emeraldensemble.org. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our mailing list to hear about future sessions of the Academy and the other activities of the Emerald Ensemble, uh, which I'm excited to say may include our will include a concert in November, our first one after the COVID era, and we're excited about that. This webinar is being recorded by participating, you are granting the Emerald Ensemble permission to share your contribution. Your microphones and cameras will remain off for the duration of the presentation. You can, however, ask questions to the presenter by typing into the chat or Q&A features at the bottom of your screen. Periodically, I will interject to field your questions. I'm here today with two remarkable persons. Uh, one is Scott Kovacs, the executive director of the Emerald Ensemble. He devised this academy as our COVID era activity and is keeping it moving even past uh, that, uh, that period. We're very excited that, uh, that we're able to keep it going. And today's presenter is Michael Bennett returning to us. He now lives outside Boston, teaching at Concord Academy, singing with Boston Baroque, and generally just taking Boston by storm. Uh, as a Tacoma native, uh, Michael was active here in Seattle for many years and is currently a PhD candidate in music history at the University of Washington. Michael also is a linguist, so he's aptly poised for today's topic, the International Phonetic Alphabet 103, vowels. Thank you, Michael Bennett. All right, thank you for the introduction. And it's great to be back uh, for the third of these installments that we've been doing on IPA. Um, you know, IPA is a really valuable tool for all uh, singers, choral and soloists. And so it's, um, it's my pleasure to lead these sessions uh, through the basics of this uh, lang transcription language. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and get my slideshow started. And hopefully everyone can see that. So once again, this is um, IPA 103 vowels. I've taken the liberty of uh, transcribing uh, vowels into IPA as well as my name. Um, and just to kind of get us warmed up. So um, as I've done with our other presentations, I'm giving just a quick overview of the content um, that we'll be covering today in today's session. So the first is just sort of defining actually what a vowel is. That sounds like a sort of um, obvious question, but it's it's good for us to kind of wrap our head around ex just exactly what we mean when we say vowel. We'll take a look at the IPA chart uh, for vowels. It's a section of the, the handout that was distributed via email prior to this session and that we've been looking at in our prior uh, webinars as well. We'll talk about different ways to describe vowels, um, which was similar to the kinds of ways that we were describing consonants. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the science of vowels, what's actually happening acoustically um, when we create different vowels. And uh, then we'll take a look at, at different um, variations of vowels. So starting with single vowel sounds known as monophthongs, um, uh, and then moving on to diphthongs. Uh, and yes, there are such things as triphthongs as well um, in English. Finally, we'll look at 
uh, vowel sounds uh, in other common choral languages, so languages that we often find ourselves singing in as choral musicians that uh, sometimes trip us up because they are unfamiliar to us as English speakers. Uh, and I've included a, a series of links at the end of this presentation too, if you really want to do any sort of deep dives into some of the topics that I've talked about today. Okay, so first starting with defining a vowel. So um, the, the sort of dictionary definition of a vowel is a speech sound which is produced by a comparatively open configuration of the vocal tract with vibration of the vocal cords, but without audible friction. So when we talked about consonants um, at the end of last semester, we were looking at the fact that a consonant is an interruption of the airflow in some way, whether it's a complete stop or a partial uh, friction that's caused, um, that's, that's what kind of defines consonants. So um, a vowel is sort of the opposite of that. It's an unobstructed um, sort of speech or, or vocal sound that's made with the vocal tract completely open um, and then formed by shaping um, and, and sort of morphing the, the shape of the vocal tract. Um, this is the uh, a sort of zoomed in look at, at the IPA, the complete vowel chart on the most recent IPA chart from uh, 2015. So um, this is, it can be overwhelming to look at. It's it, each one of these symbols represents a different vowel sound that exists in the languages of the world. Um, so these are all you know, found in some language. The IPA chart does not include um, symbols for sounds that have not been discovered. So these are all um, somewhere. I, I couldn't tell you where necessarily they all um, exist, but we'll be talking about many of them today because they do come up in the sort of um, European languages that we often find ourselves singing. Um, now, when we talk about how to describe the vowels, you can see that the chart is already labeled with a few um, key words, um, as well as this kind of uh, trapezoid type shape. And we'll talk more about where all of those things uh, come from uh, in just a moment. So one thing that I wanted to mention, uh, you know, before we, we really dive in is that, you know, vowels vary widely from language to language in terms of what we call the inventory, so that the sort of total um, menu of options in any given language. So on the left hand side here, you can see highlighted in green, these are all of the vowels um, that exist in English. Um, and, you know, we, we think of in the alphabet of, of our, our vowels as being A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y, right? But of course, um, as we know, English is one of those languages where the same uh, letter on the page often makes a variety of different sounds, which is why we have all of these, you know, we use different terms um, that, that are not necessarily phonetic uh, terms, but when we say like, oh, long I or short I, um, for instance, that's that's often how we learn, we learn the vowels when we're taught um, using phonics, for instance. Um, but then you have other languages like Spanish, which really um, has only five vowels, E, A, A, O, U. Um, and uh, we'll see that that's, it's very similar to Latin, for instance, and these are the vowels that we as singers um, tend to use for warm-ups and things like that, these kind of, um, you know, pure cardinal vowels. Uh, so, so it really just depends on the language um, and some have, have more than others. So describing vowels, so um, this, these are the, the words that we found on that, that uh, vowel chart. So um, the first descriptor that we, that we use when we're describing a vowel is uh, whether it's close or open. Um, and it's, it's, it's not close or closed, um, but it actually is close. It refers to how close the tongue is to uh, the roof of the mouth. So is it close or is your mouth more open? Another way of, of describing this, uh, which can also be used, is high versus low. Um, then, of course, so that's sort of the sort of vertical axis. Then if we think about the kind of horizontal axis within the mouth, um, we use the terms front and back, which um, refers to where is the highest point of the tongue? Is it more forward in the mouth versus uh, further back in the mouth? And then finally, the other um, aspect of vowel 
lips are is whether or not the vowel is rounded. So um, are your lips curling around um, the vowel or not? So just to give you some examples, the vowel E, um, which is the, the IPA symbol for E is the, the lowercase i, um, is would be described as a close front unrounded vowel, whereas the vowel O would be considered a close mid back rounded vowel. Um, and the vowel A ah, as the sort of bright A ah, um, is open front and unrounded. To give you a visual of kind of what I'm talking about, there's this, this wonderful uh, visual diagram that shows actually, so you see the, the little diagram here on the, on the, the left, um, that's in each one of these little um, mouths that you see on the screen with the tongue. So um, you can see like the difference between E and U, um, you can see how that's the, it's, it's the highest point uh, in the, the, the tongue is at its highest point um, for those vowels. So those are considered both high vowels, whereas for ah, uh, either bright ah or ah as in father has a quite low position of the tongue. Um, and so those are considered low vowels. And then as far as the front or the back goes, you can see the difference again with e and u, the sort of relative where the highest point for E is much closer to the front of the mouth than for U, where it's uh, closer to the back of the mouth. And that that corresponds for all the various levels um, so that you have this sort of close, close mid, close open, or uh, open mid and open uh, here with the E and the U, A and O, A and A and A and A. So. Um, if you don't believe me, which, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking anyone is doubting me, but I have this wonderful video to show you, which is um, actually an MRI scan of uh, various, a, a few different singers who move through those five vowels, um, I, E, O, U. Um, there's some variation in the pronunciation between A and A, so I, I included both there. But it's a wonderful video to show you just exactly how the tongue moves in the mouth. And you can actually see, um, you know, the sort of demonstration of the pictures that we were just looking at. Great. So it's a it's a wonderful way, uh, a use of technology um, to just really see what's happening inside the the vocal tract um, as these singers are making these vowels. You also caught a glimpse of um, the velum, the sort of soft palate lowering and raising uh, for particularly the third singer. And this will come in uh, in handy later when we're talking about um, nasal vowels. Okay, any questions so far about um, the IPA chart itself, the ways that we describe vowels, um, you know, or this, this business with the tongue position? No questions coming through yet, but I want to thank you for sharing those that video. That's really nifty. That's yep. a, yeah. It's a uh, great the, resource. What fascinates me in, 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 in a way is how subtle the shifts feel in our mouths you know if you move e to o or U or what have you and then to look at it you see how dramatic the shift really is so that's fascinating uh so yes uh, no questions great all right um so now to get a little bit more technical and even more sciencey so um i want to talk briefly about this idea of of a f the formants that are present in various uh vowel sounds so uh a formant, which is a, a, a noun meaning each of several prominent bands of frequency that determine the phonetic quality of a vowel. Um, and so that may be a sort of opaque definition, but hopefully um, in the coming slides, you'll be able to see uh, what I'm talking about. So um, 
basically what you're looking at here is what's called a spectrogram. Um, and you know, you you hopefully um, know the kind of basics of overtones that um, you know above any given fundamental pitch um, that we find in nature, either through an instrument or the human voice. There are various overtones that exist above that fundamental pitch at. Um, whole number integers of the frequency. So if you're singing a note that is 100 hertz, there are overtones at 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, all the way up. Um, and the various um, the various harmonics that are louder or softer uh, for a particular instrument or voice is what uh, we, the brain, interprets as timbre. Um, the other thing that's going on when it comes to vowels is um, the the different formants. So again, this is uh, sort of frequencies that are um, particularly loud within the spectrum. These help the brain determine uh, the quality of a vowel. So the first formant, so th this goes from bottom to top, and the first meaning the sort of lowest frequency that is uh, the, the sort of this that that first lowest band of of loud frequencies, um, roughly sort of inversely uh, is correlated to height. So when we're talking about a high versus a low vowel or close versus open, e as we as we just talked about is a is a high vowel. It's a it's a it's a close vowel, and you can see that the 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 value here um, for the first formant of the vowel e is low relative to for instance a vowel like a ah, which is quite low if you if you remember the trapezoid of the chart um you know e is way at the top and a ah is is all the way down at the bottom by ah so um you can see that from e to i to e to a ah, the first formant is actually rising it's going up and up and up right um now if you look at the second formant, so that's the sort of next uh, band of, of loud frequencies, um, that that frequency or that that formant has to do uh, with how front or back the vowel is. So um, that that formant, as you can see from e, e to it to a to a, uh, goes down. So uh, it gets gradually lower and lower. And so those those first two formants are getting closer together. Um, and again, if you can think about the chart, the reason, so it's shaped like a kind of trapezoid with the front slanted and coming in um, because from E to I to E to A, your tongue is actually moving back in the mouth. So it's getting further and further back. And that is causing the second formant to drop over the course of that, um, that shift. The third formant, uh, which is also indicated with an arrow, um, is a little bit more complicated and, and subtle, but it has to do with rounding. Um, so whether a vowel is rounded or not. So you can see um, that the, the value, um, that sort of curling that happens at the end um, for like uh, these rounded vowels down here uh, on that third formant. Okay. Um, so Let's think about this a little bit of a different way. Um, if you were to plot, uh, like on a scatter plot, this is looking very math and sciencey now. Um, but but if the if your sort of um, vertical axis is is the first formant, um, and your horizontal axis axis is the the second formant, with sort of zero zero being in the upper right hand corner, um, this is what the the sort of average. Uh, formant values for those um for all of these different vowels look like so we're plotting again where where the first formant and the second formant meet so you can see that e again has that very low e and u um, have a very low first formant but they have uh but e has a very high uh second formant because it's quite forward and u has one of the lowest second formant values because it's so far back um and What's amazing about this chart is that actually this is where the shape of the IPA vowel chart comes from. So it's it's uh, it's basic. It's loosely, as if you can see, sort of mapped on. It's simplified, but it's mapped onto um, this kind of trapezoid shape, um, which you'll also remember corresponds to the positioning of the tongue in the mouth from those video the the, the pictures that I showed 
uh, before. So that's where that's where the shape of this um, the IPA vowel chart comes from. Um, now, I wanted to point out that, of course, there is variability within each speaker. So there are programs. In fact, there are some software programs that I've linked to um, at the end of this presentation that allow you to actually um, measure your own vowel formants. Um, and, and it'll give you the sort of numerical value of the hertz, you know, where that formant is. So you can see this is a sampling of, of some Spanish speakers saying their five cardinal vowels, a, a, e, o, u. And there's, there's great variability among the sample, um, but you can still see the sort of general, um, the, the, the same general pattern is there, right? So there's the, the, um, the values that we see on a chart um, are typically sort of showing you um, the average or sort of what's the most common across a large sample size. Okay. Um, and so just, just to kind of sum up this section, when we're talking in a choral ensemble about tuning our vowels, um, that often is because of this variability. So it's like, well, everyone's saying ooh, but not everyone says ooh exactly the same way. Um, and so finding that sort of unity of exactly where your tongue is positioned um, uh, in the mouth to, to get that sort of unified formant structure, which will, which will create that sort of ring or that resonance that we're looking for um, because there aren't as many disturbances in the sound, the sort of sound waves that are created by the vocal ensemble. That's what we're talking about, actually, when we talk about unifying our vowel. Um, yes, it's, of course, the shape. Um, but it, it's it's got these sort of scientific implications as well. Okay, I see I see more more uh, questions in the in the chat now. So maybe there are some questions about this. Yeah, I, I have one also. But first, let's answer. Let's uh, tend to that one. Uh, so some interesting comments. We're talking about how big the the tongue is in the mouth and how much space it mm. takes up, uh, which can, we don't realize because we don't see it uh, as we. Right. It. it feels like there's a lot of air moving. Um, uh, but uh, one question, it's, it's so well phrased, I'm just going to, to read it verbatim. In the various regional variations of American English, uh, would you say that there is a consistent shift in formants? Like, are they all higher or, or shifted to, to, to the left in the form, in the, the, the chart, or is it more random? Um. No, it's definitely uniform. So, so the way that that different dialects pronounce certain vowels, um, you'll see. And actually, some some vowel charts, like when I pull up, um, well, we'll see this later when I'm I'm looking at uh, foreign languages. But um, the chart itself will actually show that in that language, um, there's some movement going on to where, uh, you know, in some languages, it's like in sort of classical, like if we were to, you know, the ideal structure, it would be like E is, is high and then it is next followed by A, but there are some languages where actually A is, is higher than I, meaning that the, the second or that first formant um, for the two is kind of inverted. And um, so it, it's it that's that's that sort of essence of a native speaker. It's like well, when they say the vowel i, it has a slightly different quality maybe than when an American says the vowel i. So it, it's um, that's that's the sort of very subtle differences. So you can um, you'll see when I show some of the the charts that I found, and I, this was fascinating as I was preparing for this, looking at the various charts. When you type, you know, when you search French vowels IPA chart, you you kind of get sometimes you get these kind of scatter plot images of, and you're like, oh wow, you know, the 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 sort of they're they're off from where the kind of classical um, you know model is. A, a very a related question to deal with your your uh, the uh, uh, speaker variability uh, slide. When uh, some of those uh, Spanish speakers, there were some of the like some of the O's. One of the O's in particular is totally surrounded by O's. Otherwise, yep. to us as non-native speakers, or maybe as native speakers, would that O still sound like an O, or would it sound more like an O to our ears? Well, so a great example that I'm that I'm thinking of is the way that German, when we talk about the German O or or the Midwestern O, right? Um, it's much more closed 
um, and and sort of higher, closer to the ooh vowel than we would have in sort of standard American English, right? So it's still an oh, but there's so much we you know we we sort of get at it by saying like think ooh, but say oh or you know something like that. Um, and and so that's a perfect example. I think that particular speaker probably is saying a sort of more closed kind of uh, ooh like oh um, with that little bit more shading. Um, but but you know there again it's just suggesting that the second the the sorry sorry the first format is quite a bit lower for that particular speaker um, than what is sort of like considered standard because you would say the average sort of first format is somewhere between five hundred and seven fifty whereas that speaker is somewhere between two fifty and five hundred. Um, so, but you can see there, there it's also their second form and is kind of way off too. So it's just a um, an outlier. That's good. I wonder if like that's the one person who is, you know, fr from the furthest south of Mexico or fr or is Galicia yeah. if they're if they're using classical Spanish. Spend. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Let's uh, let's keep going. Okay. Great. So. Um, I, I wanted to start with some familiar vowel sounds, which again, you know, if you're totally new to IPA, it's good to kind of wrap your head around these, these vowel sounds that come from English. These are monophthongs, um, and I've put in the bottom in orange, notice that a couple of vowels that um, that we think of as being, oh, of course we have A, O, and A ah, um, in our, our language, but actually those vowels really only um, occur as part of diphthongs. So we'll we'll talk about those in a second, but the sort of um, pure monophthongs um, that we use, um, the lowercase i, you know, as in beat. And um, these are largely what, what, what is being done here is um, uh, what are called minimal pairs. So um, it meaning that the, the difference between beat and bit, that the consonants are exactly the same. The only thing that's different is the vowel um, change. So the first four here, beat, bit, bet, and bat, right, are, are what we would call minimal pairs that you can really just hear the difference between the vowel. Um, so you've got the sort of E as, you know, as in beat, and then the, the capital I is is I as in bit, the epsilon is is E as in bet, and then that sort of um, A and E, which we call an ash, is the A as in bat. Um, and then central, so this is organized front, central, and back. So central vowels um, are the ones that we try to avoid a lot as um, as singers. So um, we have uh, the the stressed and unstressed versions of a uh and er. Okay, so when it's a schwa, which is that sort of upside down lowercase e that we um, hear about, and oftentimes we're putting at the end of, of voiced consonants like d, you know, when we're we're cutting off a, a word, um, but that's that's the unstressed version. So in in like the word about, right, and then um, mother, same thing that the er of mother. Uh, again, some people might choose to transcribe that's the last sound as an upside down R with a diacritic that that you can put that shows that it's a syllable by itself. So mother, the kind of American R, um, but it really is a kind of rhoticized vowel, which is what that little that little sort of tail on the on the schwa means. Um, and then you've got the stressed schwa, which is the uh that we would find in but. Um, as well as the sort of stressed version of of er as in bird, I would yeah, I think you see that um, more often in in British English, uh, at least that that IPA symbol, the sort of um, backwards epsilon with a with the r. Um, and then for back vowels, monophthongs, you have the oo as in boot, um, u as in book. Uh, and then these last two vowels, so aw and ah, um, and in Pacific Northwest dialect uh, and and most like sort of the whole West Coast and a lot of standard English, uh, American English dialects, caught and caught are pronounced the same way. Um, in fact, it, it has a, a specific name here called the caught caught merger, um, which is in, there are increasingly fewer people who pronounce uh, that first word differently than the second word. Um, okay, so now diphthongs. So as I said, um, a lowercase e is really only ever appears in English um, as a diphthong, a um, or a. It's it's not actually a 
E. It doesn't sort of make it all the way to that lowercase I of a pure E vowel uh, when you say a word like bait uh, or late. And then you have I as in bite or high. Um, notice that the, the A with the hook on it, um, which is the front, the sort of front version of an A vowel, um, is used when it's part of a diphthong. So I and ow. Um, whereas the monophthong uh, version in father or caught is uh, the, the A without the hook. So that's actually, those are two different IPA symbols for two different versions, the kind of bright and dark or front and back version of the A vowel. So we have I and then we have ow as in bow and how. We have O, again, that's a diphthong as in boat or coat. And then um, oi, which again, isn't really the, the pure um, o uh, as that we would say in boat. It starts a little bit more open, boy, boy and toy. Um, so we use that open o symbol for that uh, diphthong. And as we know, um, as choral singers, we are always told to sing on the first vowel of the diphthong um, until the very last moment. So that's where we, we end up singing on the A and the A ah and the O um, to, before we, we finish the word. Um, I mentioned triphthongs. Um, triphthongs, when you look up for English, it, it has um, more frequently to do uh, with the British dialects of English because um, for them, for words that end in um, R, when they're uh, in non-rhotic dialects of, of um, British or yeah, um, British English. So if they had a word like tire, um, they would say tie. And so that's I, uh, uh, three vowels in a row, a, I, and schwa, tie. Um, so that's, those are the trip songs that you get in British English. Um, okay, any any questions before we jump to um, vowels in foreign languages? Very briefly, I, uh, you've used the, the, the phrase of a rhotic dialect. Can you uh, describe more what you mean by that? Oh, yeah. Sorry, that just means a dialect of English that pronounces the R um, in either final R's. Well, basically, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, final R's. So if the final R, and there are non-rhotic uh, dialects of American English as well, lots of Southern English dialects. Um, as well as like African American vernacular English often is a non rhotic uh, version of, of English. Yeah. So, so like Irish is a rhotic dialect because they say there are R's, um, uh, but like sort of received pronunciation standard British English is not. So, so, so the pirate accent is just like ultra rhotic. That's the technical yeah. term for it. <laughs> yes. like back, exactly. back to the Greek and Latin roots. All right. Thank yeah. you. All right, so common, la common languages that we, we sing in as choral singers and their various vowels. So the first, um, I, I've sort of gone from least vowels to most. So um, uh, Latin uh, is a nice, uh, a nice language to sing in because there are really only five vowels. And actually, if you go all the way back to the first presentation that I did um, on IPA, we used, I used a Latin, I uh, used Ave Verum Corpus as an example of, of um, you know, IPA transcription. So these are the five uh, vowels that we often warm up on. Um, the, you know, but it's 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 the epsilon version of of a. So rather than the closed a vowel, it's a little more open. De like in in um, deo, for instance, um, it's it's more of the a eh, as in bet. Um, and then the o similarly is more open. So. Uh, in that same word that I just used, deo, um, it's not deo, but um, that sort of more open or domine, right, which is um, as opposed to domine, right, so the, the open o, but then you've got e and u, and the a ah is a kind of as and father, um, that kind of dark, so, so it's kind of, you can see it very clearly, like, these very well spaced out five vowels that are kind of separate from one another. Um, so it's, it, it, I think when you're warming up on these five vowels, it feels good because they feel so distinct, right? Um, whereas, you know, the difference between 
e and i is so small um you know from from a movement perspective or from a formant perspective same thing with like u and u um so it just um it feels good to kind of go around the vowel um wheel with these um just just a couple of notes one is that you you will see a y um printed in latin which is is always pronounced as an e um and then you've got these um actually these ipa symbols that we see that that we uh when they are ipa symbols they mean something totally different but um in when you see them in latin they're both pronounced as e eh, so as in chaley um for that uh, okay and then moving on to just slightly a, a, a couple more vowels so um the uh this is for italian so italian sort of takes latin and slightly expands it so um you get now the closed versions uh of the e eh and the a ah that we got in latin we now also have a and o so the sort of more closed versions of those um a nice thing about Latin and Italian is that um, the symbols as they're printed in the language are, they roughly correspond to the um, the IPA symbols themselves. So um, kind of what you see is what you get. The exception here is knowing when a printed E is A versus A, um, and when uh, a printed O is O versus A, right? The sort of open version. Of those and that's something that you kind of there there are some complex rules and if you um if you go to the ipa source um links that i've included at the end of this they they have a sort of neat although it would be a lot to remember it's like only when it's a stress syllable and before these letters you know do you pronounce it with an open in the open variety so it, it's a little hard to remember a lot of it is just through um practice and memorization um then the other thing to note about um, Italian, as far as what you see is what you get, is that often E, uh, sorry, uh, lowercase i, is not pronounced, but it's used to modify the, the consonant that comes right before it, so um, a C or a G, so um, where it becomes, you know, it sort of softens the consonant before, um, or becomes a, a J glide, a, a sort of a Y um, in between two vowels intervocalically. Um, so, in a word like joya, you can see my IPA transcription here. Um, the the e here is actually not pronounced at all. We don't say gioia, right? It just it's modifying the g consonant to be j, and then you go right to the open o vowel joy, right? Um, and then this other i in this word um, is functioning as a, a glide, um, a semi vowel here. So joya. Uh, I guess if you were to really slow down, you could say, well, there's kind of a little bit of an E there, but it, it really goes by um, quite quickly. And then um, same thing with like um, modifying a C, uh, baciare. Um, the, 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 the E is not pronounced at all. It's just making that C uh, ch sound. Um, and then also um, a U can sometimes function as like a W. So uomo, um, the word for man. Um, now you're starting to see on this chart a little bit of what I was talking about in terms of the um, the positioning of the dots. So what this is showing is um, so normally like when you, we look at the chart, E is like way up here in the corner um, and it's on the outside. Same thing with A. Um, this A on the chart is actually printed way over here. Um, and so what what this is suggesting is that the ah uh, in Italian, because there's only one ah, uh, it exists somewhere between the sort of extra bright ah uh, and the sort of ah uh, as in father. So it's still being counted as a front vowel. It's in this sort of side, the sort of front side of the trapezoid, but um, it's they've they've moved the dot all the way into the middle to show that it really is kind of a central um sound in terms of like where the formants are similarly um the aw uh, as of, of of here this is normally the dot is all the way out here and this would be sort of over here for a rounded vowel but they've moved that vowel in slightly to show that it's actually a quite quite a bit more forward than the sort of classical position of where that open o would normally be so when, if you look at where it is in italian right all the way on the outside 
um, it's 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 notably moved in for Italian. Okay, so the nice thing about Latin and Italian and all these is that we we in English we have all of these vowels, so it's easy to kind of reference them with with English words. When we where we start to panic um, is when we get to sounds that don't exist in English, right? Um, and by and large, these um, th the vowels that we encounter that are like this are rounded versions of front vowels. So we have all of these front vowels, e, e, a, and e, um, but in our in English, they're all unrounded. Um, and so these the the rounded versions of those vowels, the sort of if you put your lips around them as if you're making an ooh vowel, right? But you're saying the other vowel inside your mouth um, is how you you get at these. So often you'll hear choral directors or whatever say, you know, for for this y this lowercase y vowel, they'll say say e and then put you know ooh lips around it e. Right, so you're saying e inside your mouth, but you have u lips, um, and that's the same same for all of these, right? So these um, are vowels that pop up in both French and German. So starting with um, French, again, you're you're looking at the, the sort of scatter plot of where the the vowels go. Um, these are the the various oral vowels of. Of French. So the ones that we need to be aware of are again the, the rounded E, so E, um, which the example here is the, just the word for you, um, T U, T. Okay. Um, then there is the rounded version of A. So you say A and then you close your lips around it, A, right? So for a word like P, um, uh, like on P, um, a little bit. And then um, a, this sort of this OE um, uh, IPA symbol is the rounded version of a. So that's the word in, uh, that's the vowel in, in um, sir or, or cur, meaning heart, right? Um, so if you start to panic about these, it's, it's, it's often, you, you can think about the vowel that you know, um, and then uh, wrap your lips around it in a kind of ooh-like way, right? In order to practice, right? Um, along with those vowels, they have other familiar vowels like just the pure ooh. So knowing the difference between when you're supposed to do um, e and when you're doing ooh, especially you know, so looking at like a word like tu versus um, ku, right? Um, and they have the closed o sound as well as the open o in words like sart. Um, okay. Um, the other, the additional thing to think about for French um, is that they also have nasal vowels. So um, these are marked with that the tilde diacritic on top of the vowel. And what this means is it's used, you just say the vowel as normal, but um, as this diagram shows, you open the velar port. So you drop that soft palate to allow air to pass um, up through and into the nasal cavity and out the nose. Um, so, and the, the vowels that we, that, that do this in French are e, eh, so it's the difference between e eh and a, eh, um, a and en, and o and en. Okay. Um, now, in my research, I also, I learned there's a sort of contested thing here where, um, this this word, you know, the sort of single article um, meaning a uh, um, or one, right, um, is uh, I, what I learned is that uh, it's disappearing in many dialects of French. So it's supposed to be the the lip rounded version of epsilon, right? So a uh, a uh, uh, is like the sort of the three ways to get there. You say a, uh, then rock your lips, then open your velar port. Um, but um, basically there's an assimilation happening where this vowel is usually just pronounced um, like this, the sort of unrounded version uh, that would be like the epsilon, nasal epsilon, um, which I thought was, was interesting. Um, so, so you may see some transcriptions that use all four of those nasals um, if you want to be like very sort of specific. And there are, of course, with all of this, especially French, we sing a lot of medieval French. I'm doing a medieval or a, a Renaissance um, French piece with my 
chamber choir right now at school and um all the vowels are pronounced differently <laughs> and i had to get a you know the french teacher to come and and tell me oh yeah well in the renaissance you know they would have said it like this so um and a lot of that comes out through rhyme scheme and things like that that you can tell um all right so that's french um now german um German, you know, I think a lot of people think, wow, there's a lot of vowels in uh, English, there's a lot of vowels in French, but German really does take the cake when you look at the chart. Um, now, this is what I was talking about in terms of where there's some significant shifting going on. So, um, for instance, the the e and e vowels, which are the sort of rounded and unrounded version, um, normally these would be moved, they, they, they would be here somewhere between e uh, then e and then a, um, but what this chart is showing is that actually when you when you do the analysis uh, like the, the formant analysis of of standard German speakers, um, they are not the the e vowel is actually almost in the same place as the a in terms of where that uh, first formant is. So I you know I wouldn't worry too much about it, um, but just to know that that these vowels do exist. Same thing. Um, the, the it's interesting that the when you round your e vowel, um, it gets shoved so much further back. Just for just so it's not just about rounding; it's also a shift of the tongue in terms of um, where where that vowel is placed. Um, so, in addition to the uh, the vowels that we encountered in um, French, which was the rounded e and rounded a uh, and rounded e, they also have E and uh, which didn't exist uh, in French at all, as well as the rounded version of e, um, e. Okay. Um, and then they have some other familiar vowels, you know, to English speakers like e uh, as in book, right? Um, so they do have that vowel, u, o, a, um, a. And then um, they have this sort of alternate version of a schwa. They have a, they have a schwa as well. But there's this kind of other schwa that they use, and it's the uh, it's a lower, so it's quite significantly lower than a typical schwa, um, and it is the final syllable in words that end in er. So I put that as this last uh, bullet point here. So words like zusa or bessa um, is it's a vowel. The r is not even really there, um, and uh, they just uh, but it's it's a sort of, it's a sort of un unaccented neutral vowel, but that's lower than a schwa. Um, the other thing to pay attention to, and again, you could get really, really in the weeds about this, but um, there are what we call long and short versions of these vowels. Um, and that has to do with the length um, that is given. If you were to record a speaker saying particular vowels and then measure the duration, you know, get zoom in with a microscope and measure the exact duration of how long they were saying that vowel, you'll see that there's this distinction between long and short. Um, and so what's used um, is this sort of colon-like diacritic to show the difference. And what I'm talking about here is, is on this, um, this chart that looks sort of, um, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming, but you can see front, back, uh, unrounded, rounded, long, and short. Okay. Um, so, for instance, um, the difference between beton and beton, um, uh, which is, you know, they're spelled differently and they have different meanings, uh, but in terms of the IPA transcription, there's just a little bit more length when you're saying this, the A with the umlaut version of it versus uh, the ETT version of it. Um, again, very much in the weeds, but it's it's a sort of interesting thing to think about. So, um, and again, I, I'm not exactly sure how or why or the, the sort of, you know, if you look at like the difference between uh, Witten and Bitten, um, how you would know that one is long and one is short, I don't know, um, but it is just something to think about. In general, the kind of um, like, E, you know, beaten versus bitten. Um, usually it has something to do with, um, you know, the quality of the vowel, that E versus I, uh, which is, you know, we use that too when we're talking about in English, the sort of long versus short vowel. Um, 
I don't know. I think the double T has something to do with it, but not always, as you can see, but, you know, here. Um, but anyway, so just something to be aware of if you were doing a very narrow transcription. And this also has more to do with spoken German than it does with sing sung German, because of course, the sort of the timeline of how long you're spending on a vowel is dictated by the rhythm um, that you're singing. So um, there are also diphthongs. Um, in in German as well to be aware of I I and Ow. Okay, so um, that's that's sort of what I wanted to lead us through tonight. But I do have just a couple of um, additional resources. These are the same. This slide is the same that was included with the consonants. Uh, chart. So the first is a, a way if you need to ever type out um, these IPA symbols, there's an online tool that allows you to do that with the full um, IPA symbols, along with the ligatures that are used for uh, diphthongs and um, affricates. There's also uh, a click and hear um, IPA chart. So it's, it's, it's the IPA chart, but you can click on all of the symbols and hear a speaker saying them. Um, there's a website with the same kind of physiological visualizations of the IPA symbols. So similar to the MRI scan that we saw, they also have animated like cartoon animation versions um, and ultrasound, which, you know, just has a different kind of visual quality. Um, and then IPA source is a, a subscription service. However, they have free IPA guides for the sort of the most common languages, uh, sung languages. So you can go and look at those for free. They have examples of every letter that you might encounter in that uh, language and then how you might say it uh, or how it's transcribed in, AP, in IPA depending on um, the context. Um, Finally, I wanted to include a few more of these kind of sciencey things. So there is a software program called Voce Vista, um, which allows you to look at the spectrum of the voice. It, it is a paid, um, you, you do have to pay for it. There's not a free version of it, but um, I think uh, the Voce Vista is $99. There's also a $49 version that has less bells and whistles called Overtone Analyzer. Um, and it's a kind of, it's a really neat way to see the spectrum of uh, vowel, uh, as the, so yeah, the, the spectrum of different vowel and speech sounds, um, as well as, you know, you can do different filters um, and you can see how the, the vowel spectrum stacks up. I've included links to a couple of YouTube videos of some choral conductors who use this software actually in their rehearsal. Um, it, it's becoming a popular thing for some choral uh, directors to actually use as a way for the choir to visualize, you know, here's um, what our formants look like when we're singing and how can we, um, you know, achieve more resonance because there's a, it's a very, it's a very visual um, software. And then uh, finally, Prot is a, a software that is free. Um, it's used primarily by linguists, by phoneticians, um, but it does the same thing. It creates spectrographs. You can analyze pitch, contour, um, and overtones, um, you know, and formants um, as well. So if you want to go to town uh, playing with that kind of stuff, um, have at it. All right. So I think that is all for me. Thank you, everyone. And I'm happy to address any further questions. That's all so cool. As as a as a professed self-professed diction nerd, I'm enjoying this greatly. Um, uh, you talked about some 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 important things um, that 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 I was thinking about um, with Italian. You talked about the the vowel pairs, the kind of open and close, like a eh, a. Eh. Um, I, I I lived there for two years and used to be fluent. And what I find is so often it's it's regional. Yes. And. Um, I was curious how much of that applies also to things like the German chart of having the mm. the different variants of uh, you know what was rounded shifting back to to behind the wrong vowels as it were. Right. <clears throat> yes, I mean when I was looking for some of the images that I used on on my slides, I had to be very careful that it you know because some of them uh, that they're captioned and they'll say like 
Austrian German, you know, uh, and, right. and so then the, the plot of vowels that I was looking at was for, for Austrian German, not standard, you know, German. And again, you can get into regionalisms. It's the same thing with, you know, are we doing German Latin or French Latin or, you know, I mean, that kind of, so if you want to go down the rabbit hole of historical accuracy or regional um, accuracy, I think in general, we sort of default to standard versions of these languages now, but you, you can certainly try to be more authentic. The way I always thought it was you know, the difference between Bach German and Mozart German, but mm. then I would bring up examples like Brahms, who was from further north than Bach and then went to <laughs> Vienna, so he would have heard Viennese German when, uh, never mind, just sing German. Um, yeah. The um, uh, I'm totally going to steal some of your stuff on French, by the way, because I'm doing a thing teaching French on Saturday, so thank you for that. Uh, my final question was, um, when we had the five Latin vowels and you put those in the context of a warm up, mm. it seems that most warm ups either proceed e a a o u, which makes sense, you know, front front to back, or a a e o u. Maybe I should do it this way so that it looks mm -hmm. that way. And uh, do you know or what the the logic behind that approach is? Scott may also have have a lot on this one. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be curious. I mean, I think I think e a a o u makes more sense because it's literally doing that circle around the chart. But a a e o u is a little uh, different. It's sort of nonlinear, so I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I see you counter that. I warm up me me ma mo mu e a a o u is is generally the order, or I flip the two, or yep. or, or yep. I flip it. That's because that is the pedagogical order in which those are the the acoustic order in which those are um, are the uh, shaped in the mouth. So I, I I tend to work in that direction myself. Cool. There's a really interesting um, thing that in the the video that I included with Amanda Quist, who was at Westminster and when I was at Westminster, but now is the DC director of choral activities at uh, the Frost School um, at University of Miami. She talks about in the video that I linked to, it's quite long, so you might need to sort of skip through if you want to peruse it. But at one point, she's talking about the fact that um, she she always, you know, the, the value of using E or U as um, a neutral syllable if you're taking text out um, because of um, the science, the sort of sciencey piece that I was talking about um, referring to the form and structure. I'll just share this again. So what she says is the the because the first formant for U and E is quite low, it's usually it's close to the frequency that you might be singing, um, like the, the actual fundamental frequency of the note. Um, so if you're singing, you know, A440, you know, let's say you're you're a soprano or an alto, you're singing for 440 hertz, you know, based on this chart, that first formant for an eval is actually really close to the, the actual fundamental pitch. Um, whereas a vowel like ah, and sometimes we we go, why is it so hard to sing ah, you know, um, or why doesn't ah feel good, you know, to if you were gonna take a neutral syllable and sing da da da. Um, it's because of the format structure. It's like it's harder to kind of access that resonance um, because there's a there's a bigger gap between where the the frequency is that you're singing and that first format. So just like kind of one of those things. I I love D. I love E as a neutral syllable always, um, just because of how sort of forward and resonant it is. That's fan I need to change a few things the way I do rehearsals is what I'm learning tonight <laughs> to make it fit better. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Michael, for this uh, wonderfully informative presentation. Uh, and thank you to all of our participants today uh, for your questions and your contributions. Also, uh, as always, a great thanks to Scott Kovacs for his efforts in devising this Emerald Choral Academy in the first place. Uh, we at the Emerald Ensemble are grateful for the enthusiasm of you, our audiences and supporters who have made this fifth semester possible. As the Emerald Choral Academy continues, you can help to support these efforts by donating at emeraldensemble.org. Uh, you can also let us know of topics that you would like to see discussed in the future. 
In the meantime, I am Gary Cannon. On behalf of Michael and Scott and all of the Emerald Ensemble, I wish you good physical, mental, and musical health. Thank you.